Uh, hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Timur. Thank you for making it out here that early in the morning. Um, I'm going to talk today about initialization in modern C++. So I'm sure some of you have seen uh, this GIF. Um, I'm just going to let it play. So I found this on the internet at this URL. Unfortunately, I do not know who made it. There's no indication of who uploaded it, no copyright notice or anything like that. So I can't, unfortunately, credit the person who created this. But I think it's brilliant. Um, just going to let it play. So um, I retweeted this a couple months ago, and I think the first couple of comments were, were, well, you forgot, or this GIF, uh, the person who made this GIF forgot to mention these other three kinds of initialization. <laughs> Um, so, and the other thing, um, so Nico gave a talk uh, also about initialization at CppCon a couple of months ago, and he came up with these 19 different ways of initializing an int. Um, so I also recommend you watch his talk, it's a great talk. Um, so that's also a pretty impressive list, I think. And um, I think this is really interesting that something so basic as initializing a variable can be so complicated. Uh, I think this is really a remarkable property for a programming language. And um, I think there's probably no other area in the C++ language that caused over the years so many defect reports uh, to the standard, fixes in the standard in the next version, uh, you know, changes uh, and, and countless blog posts about how initialization in C++ is totally bonkers. And, and I think this is really interesting. And it makes it also really daunting for me to give a talk about this topic. Um, so an attempt to give a systematic overview over this all of this. Um, but then I thought, well, let's try it anyway, and how would I do it? So I came up with this um, um, kind of structure that um, I'm going to introduce the different ways you can initialize things in C++ kind of in chronological order, in the order in which they were introduced, starting with the things that we inherited from C, and then what was introduced when C++ was created, and then kind of the additional things that were introduced in later versions of the standard. And then I'm also going to talk about um, the future, about the next upcoming standard, C++20, and the changes that we're going to probably see there. And then there's going to be some recommendations about you know, what kinds of initialization to use actually in your code. And um, there's going to be some overview table at the end over all the different things and syntaxes and all the different kinds of initialization you can do and what, they, what effect they have. So um, let's start with um, what did we inherit from C? So how can you initialize a variable in the C language? So um, the first thing that you can do in C, um, so in C++ we call this default initialization, which means you just don't give any initializer at all. And this means in this case that this integer is going to store an indeterminate value, and accessing that value is undefined behavior. Um, so this program here is going to cause undefined behavior. Um, and the same happens, of course, if you have a struct. So if you have a struct with some member variables in it, you can also default initialize it, which means you can create an instance without an initializer, and then the members of that struct are also going to be uninitialized, and accessing those members will also cause undefined behavior. I'm sure this is not new uh, to most of you. Um, so, um, but the thing is, um, if you then go to C++ and you have um, classes, um, and then you have all this fancy stuff with private and public and constructors and, and methods, um, but then still, uh, it's the same situation, right? If you default initialize a class, and you don't initialize your members, then you're going to get undefined behavior. And um, so this whole C++ stuff doesn't really protect you from the, from the C behavior. And this is interesting because I spent the first, I think, one or two years of my career as a software, as a C++ developer, not knowing this. And I'm pretty sure I introduced some scary bugs and some production code in that time. So um, this was kind of non-obvious to me when I was learning C++. But then, of course, you know, when C++ came along, there were these ways of initializing our members. So in C++ 98, we got this thing which is called a member initializer list, where you would initialize your members there in the constructor. And then since C++ 11, 
we have these things which we call default member initializers where you can do them right there where you declare them. And I think this is really the, the right way of doing it and you should be using those whenever you can. Um, so this is default initialization, right? This is kind of the, the situation we're in if you don't initialize things. Um, the next way of initialization that we inherited from C is copy initialization. Copy initialization happens whenever you have an initializer that starts with an equal sign followed by an expression. So that would copy initialize int to two. And the other two um, situations where copy initialization happens is if you take an argument by value or return an argument by value, or sorry, return a return value by value. And those will also be copy initialized. So those are the three situations when an object is copy initialized. So one thing that is also confusing to beginners is that copy initialization is actually never an assignment, even though it has this equal sign in it. So this would call on an object, this would call the copy constructor, it would never call the copy assignment operator. There's no assignment anywhere in my slides in this talk. We don't talk about assignment here, so this is all about initialization. Um, and the other thing about copy initialization, which makes it special, is that if the type of the initializer and the object doesn't match, you kind of perform a conversion sequence. So for example, if you say int i equals 2.0, that's a double, so you're going to get a conversion. Uh, according to some rules that you can look up in the standard. And the third way of initializing things that we inherited from C is aggregate initialization, right? So which means if you have an array, you can do equals and can, do, can initialize the elements of the array in braces. And that is also going to give you array size deduction, so you can omit the size of the array and it's going to be deduced by the length of the, um, how many elements you have. And you can do the same with structs. So if you have a struct, and in C++ this works with aggregate types, which are basically types that only have public members, they don't have virtual functions, uh, they're just a bag of members basically, and they, you can aggregate and initialize them like that. Um, and this is valid C, and this is also valid C++ 98. So this syntax has also been with us since the beginning. Um, and um, so if you have this, then we say that foo is aggregate initialized, which means that the elements of foo, if you use the syntax with equals brace, are copy initialized. Um, the other thing that aggregate initialization has that it also had already in C is that you can omit some of the initializers from the end. So for example, if the struct has two members and you only initialize the first one with the one here, and you omit the second one, then it's going to be zero initialized by default. So whenever you use aggregate initialization, you can never end up with uninitialized members in this scenario because the ones that you don't initialize, they're just going to be zero. Um, so this program here has defined behavior, right? So we initialize i to one and then j is just going to be zero. So this program returns zero. That's well-defined behavior in this case. Um, Right, um, and then that's also obviously a convenient way to, for example, zero out a lot of memory. So you can initialize an array with empty braces, and then the whole thing will, is just going to be zero initialized. Another specialty of aggregate initialization is brace elision. So who can tell me what this program is going to return? Anyone awake? Two. two? Someone said two. Any other guesses? Zero. Zero. Right. So what happens here is that it returns zero because so you have this bar. So first you have this foo member which has two, two members. Uh, sorry, the foo struct which has two members. And then bar has also two members. One of this is this one and the other one is the it. And so the foo is a sub-aggregate. So you would normally initialize it like this where you initialize the sub-aggregate with that expression, which is going to initialize those two, and then the second element of bar, which is the int k, you're going to initialize like this, and then you can omit the zero, and then it's going to be default, by zero initialized by default. But brace elision means that you can omit those nested braces when you do aggregate initialization, which means that in this case, one and two is not going to initialize the two members f and k, as you would expect, but it actually initializes f i and f j, and k is going to be zero initialized. Right, so this is, this is kind of a, special uh, trap that 
algorithm information gives us, which is also exists in C, so it was like that since forever. So what have we got so far? So we're now, we're now in C land. We have default initialization, which is not initializing, not giving an initializer, which means things are going to be uninitialized. And in C++, they're going to call the default constructor, and then you have to take care of initializing the members yourself. The second thing that we have is copy initialization, which means equal, pass by value, or return by value, and that's going to perform the conversion sequence. And we have aggregate initialization with equals brace. Um, and if you omit the elements from the end, then they undergo zero initialization. So this is where we are in C. Anyone, any questions about that so far? Right, that looks good. So next step, C++ is born. What's the one big feature that C++ introduces that, that changes the picture here? Constructors, exactly. So C++ introduces constructors. You need a way to call them. They can take more than one argument, right? So the syntaxes that we've seen, they don't really work. So when Bjarne created C++, he introduced the syntax which um, has these parens, and then you write the arguments to the constructor in parens. And so that everything is consistent, you can also use the same syntax to initialize built-in types that are not actually class-type objects. They don't have constructors or destructors, but they just follow the same logic. So you can now initialize an int like this, where you give it the initial value in parens. And um, this way of initializing things in C++, we call this direct initialization. So that's the fourth kind of initialization that we now get from C++. Um, and direct initialization basically is whenever the initializer is round parens with some arguments inside. So um, there are some differences here, though, right, between direct initialization with the parens and copy initialization with the equal sign. So there's obviously no difference for ints. So if you say int i3 or int i equals 3, that's just going to initialize that into 3. That's really obvious. Uh, but for class types, there are some differences. So first of all, of course, the direct initialization syntax can take more than one argument, which is really useful if you want to take, uh, call constructors. And then it does, not also, it does not perform the conversion sequence that um, copy um, initialization does. Instead, it performs overload resolution, right? So it's like a function call. So basically, if you have these parens, this is what I like about the syntax, right? Round parens is the same syntax that you use to um, call regular functions. And then you can reason about that the way that you say, well, we want to call a constructor, and then what happens is that normal overload resolution is performed on those constructors. And based on that, the compiler is going to select the constructor and call it. Right? So what happens here is overload resolution. Um, so this difference between the conversion sequence and the overload resolution thing, um, so obviously copy, um, copy initialization is also going to do the, the call a constructor and perform overload resolution, but it's going to do this conversion stuff first. And uh, one thing where you really see this is if you have explicit constructors, so um, in this case, uh, explicit constructors are not converting constructors. So they don't, don't participate in the conversion sequence, which means that if you, have, if you use copy initialization, it's not going to select that constructor because it's not a converting constructor. It cannot participate in the conversion sequence. So you're going to get a compiler error here. Whereas if you use the same, with the, the same initializer with the direct initialization syntax, that's just going to perform overload resolution. So you give it an int, there's a constructor that takes an int, so we're just going to call that. So that's the difference. And um, you can come up with uh, more interesting uh, cases where they actually call different constructors, right? So here, if we have an explicit constructor that takes an int and we give it an int, if you use copy initialization, that's not going to consider an explicit constructor because an implicit constructor cannot do implicit conversions. It cannot participate in a conversion sequence. So it's going to instead call the other constructor the double constructor, which is a worse match, so you're going to convert the int to double. But if you use direct initialization, that's going to just do overload resolution. You know, there's a constructor taking an int, there's one taking double. The one that takes an int is a perfect match, so let's call that. So you're going to end up calling different constructors just depending on what syntax you use in this case. Um, so um, direct initialization does not only happen if you do it like that, but it happens basically wherever you have any situation that where you initialize things and then you have initializers in parens. So 
You also get direct initialization if you do this constructor call notation. You just create a temporary of type foo uh, and give it some arguments. Uh, or if you have a new expression, so you knew an object and you give it the initializer there and the new expression with parents. Or if you have a static cast you know, with parents, those are all um, cases in the language where we would perform direct initialization. So uh, direct initialization is great. Unfortunately, it uh, creates um, some ambiguities because parents are used for other things as well. Um, and it creates parsing problems. And there's quite a lot of them, but um, probably the, most, the one that people run into most is the spacing parse. I'm sure some of you have run into that in practice. So what happens here is that we have a struct foo, and then we have a struct bar, and bar takes, the constructor of bar takes a foo. And then what you want to do is you want to create a new bar using direct initialization, and you're just going to want to give it a default constructed foo. So we are now in C++ 98, right? So then you would do foo paren paren. So create a foo temporary, pass it as an argument to the constructor of bar, but actually, so that's going to compile, but that's not going to do what you want, because this will instead be parsed as a function declaration. So the rule is, Anything that can happen that can be parsed as a function declaration will be parsed as a function declaration. So bar will actually not be an object of type bar at all. It will be a function that takes as an argument a function that takes no arguments and returns a foo and returns a bar. Right? So you're going to be declaring a function, which is going to compile. But whenever you want to use this bar object later, you're going to, then you're going to get a compiler error there because it's just completely the wrong type. It's actually a function declaration. Right? So this is the, kind of one of the main problems that were created by the direct initialization syntax, that you have these parsing ambiguities. Right, so this is where we are in C++ 98, right? So just the overview again, we have these three types of initialization that we inherited from C. Well, actually four, because you have default, copy, and aggregate, and aggregate does zero if you, zero initialization if you omit some of the initializers. And now we get this direct initialization, which has this new behavior and has uh, also this new problem that C doesn't have. So this is where we are in C++ 98. Anyone has any questions about this so far? Right? So this is probably all very basic, um, which is great, because then we can kind of keep going from here. Um, so the next uh, version of C++ after C++ 98 is C++ 03. And, um, so I think most people think C++03 is kind of a minor bug fix release uh, after C++98. But actually, C++03 introduced some new stuff. Can someone name a feature, a new feature that was introduced by C++03? Anyone? Right. So actually, C++03 introduced a pretty big thing. C++03 introduced a new way of initializing objects that doesn't exist in C++98. Right. So that's... That's a huge thing. And that's called value initialization. So C++03, we get a new way of initializing things, which is called value initialization. So what is this program going to do? Anyone awake enough to answer this? Return zero. Return zero. Right. So in C++98, this is undefined behavior. Because you create an int, you don't initialize it, and then you access that value and return it, and that's undefined behavior, right? You're accessing an uninitialized value. In C++03, however, if you initialize something with paren paren, like with an empty paren initializer, that is not going to do default initialization like I did before. That's going to do value initialization, which is this new thing. And, what, and so that happens whenever you have a pair of empty parens as the initializer. And what does value initialization do? Whenever the initializer is a pair of empty parens, you get value initialization. And if the type has a user-provided default constructor, we're going to talk about this in a minute, then the obvious thing happens, you're going to, it's going to call that default constructor, right? So no surprises there. But if you don't have a user-provided default constructor, then you get zero initialization, right? So that's the new thing. So by default, you don't get default initialization, you get zero initialization, right? So in that example, the int, int paren paren would actually create an int that is initialized to zero. Now let's talk about this for a little bit more. Um, so 
So here we have a struct foo that has a member um, i, and then we create an instance of that struct um, in a function, and we value initialize it with parens, and we return that. So then, um, um, and then we access that member, and again in C++ 98, that would be undefined behavior in C++ 03. This is value initialization because we use paren paren. So you get zero initialization because we don't declare, there's no user declared constructor here, right? Foo does not have a constructor declared. So that means value initialization happens, you get zero initialization, which means this program is fine. So, uh, but the, the, the nuance here is this user provided constructor. So if you do provide a constructor, so if you, for example, write a constructor, the default constructor, give it a body that does nothing, um, then the behavior changes, right? Then you get also value initialization, but now it's going to call the default constructor, which in this case doesn't initialize anything, and now your program has undefined behavior just because you added that, that constructor, right? Um, and since C++ 98, uh, if we have an empty constructor like this, we can actually default it. Uh, sorry, since C++ 11, uh, we have this syntax, right? You can say foo paren paren equals default, which is going to give you a default constructor, um, which is generated by the compiler. And that is user defined because you define the constructor as default, but it's not user provided because you don't provide the body of the constructor, right? So that's, that's the difference here. User provided basically means you didn't write the body of the constructor. But if you default it, then it means it's user defined, but not user provided. In this case, Again, because value initialization gives you zero initialization if you don't have a user provided constructor. This is not a user provided constructor, so you again get zero initialization and this program is fine and that's going to return zero. Of course, there's another trap here. Um, this only works if you do the equals default inline. If you do it out of line, that doesn't count as a user, user um, declared but not user provided constructor. That counts as a user provided constructor. So if you just move the equals default outside of the struct, then you get undefined behavior again. The reason for that is that basically this counts as a function, as a, as a constructor body that you wrote, because it could be in a translation unit, in a different translation unit, right? For the equals default, you can write that in another translation unit, and the compiler, when compiling the, the header containing the definition of struct foo, it wouldn't see whether you default it or not, right, if you do it out of line. So it just assumes that you wrote a body for it somewhere, and that counts as a user provided constructor. So in this case, even if the equals default actually is in the same file, now you get undefined behavior again, right? So to summarize again, so we have these kinds of initialization we have from C, and then C++ 98 introduces direct initialization, and then C++ 03, we have this value initialization. Right, paren paren, that performs default initialization or zero initialization, depending on whether you have a user provided default constructor. And of course, the syntax with the paren paren also suffers from the most vexing pass problem, right? So if you have a class foo, and then you write foo foo paren paren, you don't actually get a default like a value initialized foo, instead you declare a function that takes no arguments and returns a foo, right? So this is where we are in C++03. Everyone good with that? Cool. So now comes the big, the big leap forward, right? So, so what happens after C++03? After C++03, we get C++11. And C++11 is this big new thing which changes everything and you get uniform initialization, which I call unicorn initialization, uh, which solves all the problems. So, because obviously what we saw is kind of problematic. Yeah? We have these parsing problems, we have, um, we have too many different syntaxes that, that initialize things. Um, they do subtly different things, as you've seen in the last 20 something minutes. And then whenever you have parents, you have these vexing problems. Um, and the, the, the other thing is that it's really annoying that in C++03 you can aggregate initialize arrays and you can aggregate initialize these kind of structs, um, these, these aggregate types, but you can't do it with other things that are conceptually also something like range array-like things like containers, right? So you can't write in C++03, uh, so the vector, vector and then brace initialize it like you would do with an array. Instead, you have to do this ugly thing where you create it and then you reserve and you push back. 
Um, so, so these are all the problems that C++11 attempts to solve. How does it attempt to solve it? By adding one more initialization syntax, right? So we have uh, so the kind of parens they're taken, the equal signs taken, uh, equals brace is taken, but the brace without the equals is something that didn't exist in the language before. So that's like a place in the grammar which is not occupied yet. So let's use it. Um, and that's called list initialization. And the idea is that it's just going to do everything. It's just going to take all these different kinds of initialization that we saw before, and just depending on what kind of type you have, that's just going to do the right thing. Um, so um, it actually comes in two flavors. So if you write just the initializer as a brace, um, then that's called direct list initialization. And if you do the equals brace syntax, which is uh, looks the same as the old C aggregate initialization syntax, then that's called copy list initialization, right? So again, whenever there's an equal sign, like that's called copy something. So although actually a lot of the time nothing actually gets copied because a lot of the time the compiler will elide the copy or do a move or not do anything at all, um, but that's just what we call it. Um, and those things in the braces, they're called braced init lists. So they are not objects. They don't really have a type. They're this magic language entity that... Um, just is this braced init list. Um, so um, how do we make vectors work um, with this syntax? So obviously in CSS 11 you can do this, where you brace initialize the vector, you give it a list of elements, and that's going to fill the vector, initialize the vector with, with those elements. So that's uh, what happens, and that's what you want. And I think really so far this whole idea of uh, uniform initialization in CSS 11 is a good idea, right? Um, but I think at this point where it's about, like, how do you make that work, the CSS committee maybe took a bit of a wrong turn here. Um, so what they did is they um, introduced, they solved this problem by introducing the std initializer list. Um, so the way it works is that you add, if you want a type to support this braced init syntax, uh, you give it a constructor which takes a std initializer list. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and then if you write... Is that still work? Yeah. And then if you write um, the braced init list, so it has, as I said, it's not really an object, it doesn't have a type, but it has this magic property that it implicitly converts to a std initializer list if you are trying to call a constructor. So then what happens is that the std initializer list uh, constructor is getting called, and the thing that you want happens in there. And I think this is really problematic. So first of all, the std initializer list thing, it's, it's a type, right? It's, it's a kind of a magic library container type. It's basically like a fixed size vector with const elements. So it's, it's, you know, it's actually a type. You know, it has begin and end functions. It has its own iterator type. Uh, if you want to use it, you need to include a header, like, like include std initializer list. And uh, the elements in there are const, so they're actually not movable. Mo movable. Um, so you actually technically copy this object around if you pass it around. So it wouldn't actually happen most of the time. Like a compiler would elide the copy, but like semantically, this is what happens, right? You're passing around a non-movable object. Um, um, so that's actually um, that's another problem. Right? The semantics you get is the semantics of passing around an actual object. Um, and then the the next problem is that if you use this braced init list syntax, um, compilers are going to look for std initializer list constructors first, right? And if it could possibly find, uh, uh, if it could possibly match what you wrote with a, uh, with a constructor that takes a std initializer list, it's going to call it. And only if that fails would it even consider other constructors. And this has a lot of unfortunate consequences, which you will see in a minute. So, um, you know, uh, Shafiq posts these uh, C++ polls on Twitter, and one of the recent ones was, um, you know, if you had a magic wand and you would go back in time and remove, if you could remove a feature from C++, which one would it be? And the winner was, initialize the lists. Um, and um, so Jason Turner also gave a talk how initializer lists are broken. Um, and it's a one and a half hour talk about, like in detail about what's wrong with certain initializer lists. So if you want to really like understand the technical issues here, I recommend you to watch this talk. Um, so basically, if you recall that if you use direct initialization, we, use, we just use regular overload resolution for constructors. So in this case, we are doing this thing where we just call these std initializer list constructors instead. And that creates a lot of problems. So this is probably the most, uh, the example that gets shown most is this vector constructor. 
And then it turns out that if you initialize it with two integers and you use direct initialization, then you're going to get a vector which contains three zeros, right? Because you do overlet resolution of the constructors. There's a constructor that takes you know, a, a size t and, and an element type, which, and then it's going to construct that many elements. So if you give it three and zero, it's going to create a vector with three elements that has the values that have the value zero. Whereas if you use braces instead, it's going to call the initializer list constructor, and that's going to treat it as a list of elements, and then you're going to get a vector with two elements in it, three and zero. And I think that's really confusing. And that's not the only, that's not the only case, right? There's many more. So uh, this is another great one. So um, you can do the same with string. Um, so you can give it 48 and an A, and then it's going to create a string which contains 48 A's. But if you then do the same thing but change the parents to braces, what's that going to do? Can someone tell me what that's going to do? Zero? Right. So it turns out that the ASCII code of 48 is zero. So you get this string. Right? And this is, this is really weird because so what it does is it really tries really hard to call its initialize this constructor. And then you have an integer as the first element. And then it implicitly converts this integer to a char, right? So you get the, the char character zero with the ASCII code 48, um, which is really a weird conversion. And it's going to prefer that instead of the constructor that is a perfect match, right? That takes an integer and a, and a character. And it's not going to call that. So, so I think that's, um, that's really unfortunate. And, and that's a problem, especially um, even more so than this in templated code. Imagine you have a function like this, where you, you, know, you brace initialize something that you know, supports initializer list syntax inside a template, where you know, the element type is maybe a template parameter, and maybe the size is also a template parameter. What's this going to return? It's really not that easy to see, is it? So the answer is, if you do it with string as a template argument, it's going to return three. What happens if you, if you change string to int? Just, just there in the return test, you change the string to int. What, what, what's the function going to return then? One. One, yeah. What, what happens if you use float? I don't actually know, but like, this is really, like, you cannot reason about this code, right? So, so unfortunately, list initialization is, is pretty much useless in templated code. So this is also the reason why you can't even write, you know, something like make unique, like a templated function uh, that does a perfect forwarding for, for aggregates, right? It's not possible. You can't do these things you know, if you have to use aggregate initialization. You, can't, you just can't write that. And um, that's really bad. Um, so. We're going to fix some of these problems in C++ 20, um, and I'm going to just wait. We're going to do that later. Uh, but for now, let's just summarize what list initialization actually does. So um, if you have an aggregate type, which means an array or one of these classes which, where all the members are, all the non-static members are public, and you don't have virtual functions, et cetera, that's just going to do the same thing as before. It's going to do aggregate initialization. Then if you have built-in types, like int, uh, it's just going to also do the obvious thing, right? So you get direct initialization or copy initialization, depending on whether you use direct list initialization or copy list initialization. And then for class types, first it will greedily try to call a constructor that takes us to the initializer list, and it even will do all kinds of weird conversions if, uh, to, in order to do that, as we saw before. And if there's none, then it's going to do the same thing as direct initialization, which means as if you would have the normal parent syntax. Where, of course, of course, the cool thing here is then if you use the braces, you don't get the vexing pass problem, right? So the braces don't compete with function call syntax. So we got rid of that problem. And then there's another special exception there. If you use equals brace with a single element in there, that's just going to ignore the braces uh, for class types and treat this as copy initialization. Right. And then there's a few more things. So empty braces are actually also very special. So obviously, for aggregate types, as we saw before, if you do brace brace, it's just going to do aggregate initialization where you didn't give any initializers, which means that everything is going to be zero initialized, which is useful. 
But then empty braces has this, have this exception that they don't actually do the same behavior as non-empty braces, which always call, try to call the still initializer less constructive. If you have empty braces, instead, if they're, go if they're going to try to call the default constructor first. Right? So if you have a struct that has a default constructor, which takes no arguments, and that also has an initializer less constructor, and then you give it brace brace, that, surprisingly to some people, will actually call the default constructor. And um, so only if there is no default constructor, it will actually call the initializer list constructor with an empty initializer list. And if you don't have that either, then you get a value initialization. So the same as paren paren, but again, without the most vexing pass problem. So here's a summary, empty braces. Right. So in this case, if you have a struct and it has, again, um, a user defined, in this case, equals default, but no user provided constructor because it didn't write the, the body and you didn't default out of line, um, then, so it doesn't have a user provided constructor, the struct foo, so if you do brace brace, you get a value initialization, which means i will be zero initialized, no vexing pass, great. Uh, that code wouldn't compile if you use paren paren, you would you know, get vexing pass. And then this is defined behavior that's going to return zero. Right? So there's the same pitfall here. Um, the other special thing about list initialization is that it's not allowing narrowing conversions. So if you do this, this is not going to compile. It's going to refuse to convert the double to an int inside a braced init list because that's a narrowing conversion. Um, so that's probably the most common breaking change if you switch um, your compiler from C++ 98 to C++ 11. Um, so that is not allowing narrowing conversion in a braced init list. And that actually also holds if you use the braced init list to call a constructor. Um, and then there's this thing about nested braces. So we saw that if you have nested braces in, if you do aggregate initialization, you get brace elision. So you can actually omit these braces and it's going to insert them when, whenever it thinks that they're needed. Um, so with um, list initialization, which is not aggregate initialization, you cannot do that. Um, but you can do other things with nested braces, and, and they're, they're useful. So, so here's the good case where you have a map, which is essentially a range of pairs of two elements. And so by using list initialization syntax, you can, you can, you can use this really nice way of doing it, where you have an outer list and then the pairs, like individual elements, are initialized with these inner lists. Um, and that works, and that's really nice. Um, and again, the way it works is, uh, so you have the outer initializer list, which are going to be your elements, and then the compiler sees, well, you wrote two elements, so you're gonna get a map with two things in it. And then those elements themselves are also braced init lists, and it knows the type of those elements, which is pair of string and in. Um, so then it's going to initialize each one of those with the inner thing which obviously works in this case. Uh, so that's the good case. There's also the evil case, right? So if you have a vector of strings and then you just do a regular brace in it list, then that's going to create a vector with two strings in it, A, B, C, and D, F. But what happens if you add another pair of braces? Anyone? So that's actually undefined behavior. And, and, and the way, so, so you really have to kind of understand what these nested braces mean. So the outer list is always, that's the list of elements, right? So in this case, the outer list contains one thing, which is the inner list. So you're gonna get a vector with one element in it, right? So that's the first thing. And then uh, what is that element? That element is the inner braced init list. And we, so what we're gonna do is we know the element type, which is string, so we're gonna, uh, uh, brace initialize that one element with this brace init list, which contains two, two uh, uh, const char star liter string literals. So you're gonna try to initialize a string with two, two string literals, and what's, what is that going to do? You get the pointer. Right, so string is a constructor that takes a begin and an end iterator, right, to a range of characters. So it's going to, because the, the literals are const char star, it's going to treat those pointers 
as two iterators, like a begin and an end iterator, and then it's going to try to initialize a string from that range of characters, right? So it's going to read kind of A, B, C, and then it's going to run into some who knows what memory with something in it, and that's going to probably crash or do something weird. It's undefined behavior, right? Just by adding these braces. So, so really, the way to think about this is that you, know, you go from outer to inner and kind of see what elements you have and how many elements you have. And the outermost one decides how many elements you have. And there's one thing in it, which is the inner list. So you're going to get one element, and then you have to reason about how that one element is going to be initialized. Right? And then there's all these rules that if you use braces, then you get set initializer list constructors. And then if you don't have them, then you're going to get older resolution, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what you have so far? We are now in C++ um, 11. Um, so we still have default initialization, copy initialization, aggregate initialization, direct initialization, value initialization, and zero initialization. And now we also get list initialization, either direct or copy list initialization, which can perform either aggregate initialization or direct initialization or copy initialization or value initialization. And it has these problems with set initializer list, and it's virtually useless in templates. So that's C++ 11. Next version, C++14. Um, so there were some fixes, because some of these problems can be fixed. So the committee fixed them in C++14. One particular problem that got fixed in C++14 is uh, one with aggregates and direct member initializers. So the way aggregates were defined in C++11, it, they, uh, aggregate types could not have DMI. So whenever you would have a direct member initializer, DMI like, like here, you, you could not use the aggregate initialization um, which was really confusing to a lot of people. So since C++14, that works. Um, the second fix is um, this thing, where C++11 also introduced auto, and then you have to decide what's going to happen if you use auto together with list initialization. And then what happened in C++11 is that you had this really weird inconsistency that you know if you have all these different syntaxes and you use int, uh, it's always going to obviously create an int and initialize it to three. But if you use auto instead of int for copy initialization, direct initialization, it's going to do the obvious thing. But whenever you have auto followed by a brace init list or equals brace init list, that would actually deduce a std initializer list, which is, I would say, useless in most cases where you would write this. So this was really inconsistent. And that's so basically, yeah, even if you write one element or, or several elements, it wouldn't matter. It would always deduce a set initializer list in, um, in, in CSS 11. So that got partially fixed in CSS 14. So in CSS 14, the O2I brace, so the direct list initialization syntax got fixed because everyone said, what we expect here is that this should be an int. So since CSS 14, direct list initialization with auto is valid only if you have one element in there, and that's going to do direct initialization. And if you have more than one element in there, that's going to be ill-formed. So that's the, the third line in the, in the second paragraph. And the last line, if you have copy list initialization, this is still going to deduce std initializer list always, if you have equals rates, um, which makes it kind of inconsistent with the int i equals brace syntax. But at least it's consistent with itself. right? So if you have auto something equals brace init list, then that's always going to be an initializer list, no matter how many elements you have in there. Right. So um, those are the things that were fixed uh, for initialization in C++14. And the current standard, of course, is C++17. So in C++17, again, th a few things got changed. Um, one of the really nice uh, things in there is something that's called guaranteed copy elision. So since we have auto, uh, people were thinking about um, you know, whether it's actually useful to always initialize things by writing auto, because auto has this nice property that you can never forget to write an initializer. Right? So if you use auto x without an initializer, that's not going to compile ever, because it's not going to know what type x is. So using auto consistently uh, to initialize everything make, means that you can never forget to initialize something, which is a really nice uh, really nice property. So sometimes, uh, you know, if with an int, you would just do the obvious thing, so write auto one, and then one is an int. If it's not so obvious what type that is, you would um, actually write the type, but write it on the right-hand side. Um, 
And um, so there was this um, article by Herb, which was called uh, Almost Always Auto, and then there were other articles, and people kind of started using that. That's really nice. There was a problem, though, that this only works if uh, your class has a copy constructor, because in uh, so pretty much every uh, any time the compiler would not actually copy anything here, right? So it would just initialize, uh, create an object of type foo and initialize it. Uh, there's no need for a copy here that would be elided, but unfortunately, it would require that the copy constructor is still there, even though it would never be called. And if you don't have a copy constructor, it would not compile, which is really annoying. So in C17, that got fixed. Um, so now um, you can actually use the syntax with types that are not copyable and not even movable, like, for example, stud atomic. So that's called guaranteed copy elision because the compiler knows that it's never going to copy. It always can elide this copy in this case. It's not going to require anymore that you have a copy or move constructor, and it's going to compile anyway. Uh, and that's really nice because now um, that works, and now almost always auto actually becomes always auto. So I think this is really a good thing to do. Um, so, yeah. So, but otherwise, in C++ 17, we still live in this, this kind of world where we have these kinds of initialization that we have talked about so far. Everyone good so far? Great. So, which means, oh, one thing I forgot to mention, C++ 17 also introduced another feature called class template argument deduction, or CTAD, where you would actually uh, like write a template and omit the, the template arguments and then initialize an object and then the template arguments would be deduced from the initializer and that creates a whole new set of kind of rules and issues. Uh, it's a quite complicated topic so I don't have the time to go into CTAD now but actually I have a whole one hour talk just about CTAD which I gave at CPPCon a couple months ago so if you want to know more about CTAD and how that works with initializers and the kind of pitfalls there then I encourage you to check that out. Um, but now, okay, C++ 17, this is the world we live in today, and we still have a bit of time, so I can talk about the future. C++ 20, which is, community is still working on that, but it's, you know, starting to get into a good shape, and it's going to be released in two years. Um, and C++ 20 for initialization is going to do several good things. Uh, the first really big thing is that C20 is actually going to introduce a new way of initializing objects. Yay! Yay. Um, which is called designated initialization. And that's uh, a feature that um, has been first uh, introduced in C, in C99. And now we also get it in C20, uh, uh, um, which means that whenever you aggregate initialize, so it only works with aggregate initialization, instead of just writing an initializer list, you can actually say which member you want to initialize. So you would do this like dot .a, in this case dot .a equals something and dot .c equals something syntax, which means that you can also omit some of those, like we omitted b here and that's going to be just zero initialized. So we can kind of selectively initialize members when we do aggregate initialization. So if, if you're familiar with the C++ 99 feature, it's pretty much the same thing except it does a few things that, so the C version does a few things that are not allowed in the C++ version, uh, which um, basically are in C, you can do this out of order, so you could do C first and then A. Um, you can't do that in C++20 uh, for reasons that, you know, in C++ actually the initialization order is important because you initialize things in an order, declaration order, and then the destructor is going to destroy these things in the uh, reverse order and, and kind of order is important, so you can't do it out of order. You can't nest these things in C++, you can, you can in C. You cannot mix uh, designated initializers and regular initializers in a brace init list in C++, which is weird and confusing anyway. And, and you can't do it with arrays. So in C, you can also do it with arrays. In C++, you will not be able to do that. So it's a bit more restrictive, but you know, it's, it's basically a C compatibility feature. It's nice. Um, and then there's a, a number of other things that will happen in C++20 for initialization. So the first thing uh, that I want to mention here is this little uh, fix. It's basically a little consistency fix. Uh, by the way, I put the links to the actual proposals uh, in there at the top. So if you want to kind of know the details, you can go to that URL and, and read the paper. Um, so that's really just a small uh, fix where... So you can use these brace init lists in different places, including in new expressions. And sometimes people ask, 
well, do they actually behave everywhere the same? Like, would you get the same behavior for a base standard list in a new expression as you would do, you know, in any other declaration? It turns out, well, most of the time, yes, but sometimes not. Like, for example, in a new expression, it doesn't do every size deduction. So that's like another weird exception, which basically exists. It was basically an oversight when braced and its syntax was introduced. So we fixed that, so now you get every size deduction new expressions as well. It's not really something that a lot of people would write, but it just makes it a bit more consistent. Um, the other big thing is that aggregates, actually we changed the definition of an aggregate type for C++20. So right now you have this really weird thing where an aggregate um, is a type, uh, one of the restrictions is that uh, an aggregate cannot have a user provided Const uh, a, a constructor, but then, as we saw, we have these weird cases where equals delete and equals default are not considered as user provided, and then you get this weird behavior where you have an aggregate type, uh, you have just some type, and you say, well, default constructor equals delete. I will nev I'd never want the user to initialize objects of that type, right? And then it turns out, well, yeah, if you default initialize them, you're going to get an error, obviously, because the default constructor is delete it, but if you aggregate initialize them, that works, because that's going to bypass that constructor and just do aggregate initialization. So you actually can instantiate an object where the author didn't intend you to do so. So that's really weird, and that's going to be an error in C++20, because um, now the definition of an aggregate type includes the sentence that it cannot have any declared constructors at all. Um, so, and then the other big change that we actually um, just kind of voted that we want to have that in C++20 last week at the committee meeting in San Diego. Um, and I think this is really the big exciting one. I'm really excited about this, actually. So as we saw, there are different problems with list in it, uh, list initialization. So it's difficult to see when it's going to call one of these std initializer list constructors and when it's going to do the other thing. It's pretty much used as in templates. And actually, the other thing I didn't mention so far is that it doesn't work with macros at all. Like, if you have a, like a third, for example, as a macro, and then you want to do something with a brace init list in there, that's just going to break, because uh, the preprocessor has a special treatment for commas inside parens, but that doesn't work with, with curly braces, right? So it's going to think that the argument, brace to comma, the macro argument is over. It's going to pass the next thing as uh, not the brace init list argument, but like the next macro argument, and the whole preprocessor is just going to blow up, and it's all really horrible. So you can't use brace init lists in, in macros either. Um, so the way we want to fix all these problems is we want to allow um, aggregate initialization with parens instead of braces, right? So that currently doesn't work in C++17. You would have to use braces to get aggregate initialization. In C++20, you will be able um, to aggregate initialize using parens, right? So that is going to compile. That's, that's kind of the, the big thing. And it's also going to work for arrays, so you will also be able to initialize arrays. Basically, aggregate initialization will work if you just replace the curlies with parens. And that means all of a sudden you can use aggregate initialization in templates, you can use aggregate initialization in macros. Um, you know, it just fixes a lot of these problems. I think it's really great. Um, the, basically, the idea is, if you kind of follow through on that idea, that paren paren and brace brace basically will do the same thing most of the time. Like, the only two exceptions are that braces uh, will still be able to call these std initializer list constructors, which parens cannot do, and braces will not allow narrowing conversions. But otherwise, they will just behave the same. I think we could call this uniform initialization 2.0, right? The next uh, attempt to actually clean this up. But I think this one is really nice. So uh, basically, you can just use parens or curlies. They will do the same thing everywhere, except if you want this really special behavior of std initializer list, which is kind of its, its own thing, right? So if you want to say, yes, I'm using that, then you can use curlies, right? Otherwise, you can just use parens. So you kind of isolate these problems from, from the rest of the language. Um, so yeah, I think, I think this is great. I'm really looking forward to having that in C20. So now we come to uh, one of the last slides, which is recommendations. So we have all these syntaxes, they do all these different things, like how do we, how do we actually... So um, first thing that I would really recommend is use auto. Use always auto. I think that's great. Um, the second thing that I think is kind of, um, well, maybe not self-evident, but kind of 
I think it's, it's good practice, is that if you have something like an int or some other either built-in type or like a type that obviously behaves like a very simple value type, um, just use equals. You know, that's the natural syntax. That's the syntax that we have in almost all other programming languages. I think this is just the one that creates the least confusion. Um, now, obviously, you need to use braces, and those are the cases where you really have to use braces, which are aggregate initialization, right? You have to use braces for that. You have to use braces for std initializer list. And the other thing that I didn't mention so far is that you also have to use braces for direct member initializers, like either equals or braces, because parens, direct initialization, they do not work in direct member initializers, which this creates other problems as well. I'm going to go into that. But. So if you want to use one of those three things, then use braces. And actually, um, personally, I would actually recommend when doing aggregate initialization to use equals brace, because that makes it kind of a bit more obvious what you're doing. Um, and also, the recommendation for aggregates will probably change in C++20 because then you're going to be able to just use parents. Um, and then the other thing is brace brace is really great for value initialization. So if you want to create a temporary of an object really quickly somewhere, which is just default initialized, then or you know, zero initialized, depending on whether it has a user provider constructor, um, just use brace brace. That's simple. It doesn't have the vexing path problem of parent paren. That's really useful. And then we come to the controversial one, which is kind of what to actually use for um, calling a regular constructors. And I personally use parens uh, most of the time. I think this is the controversial one. I think Nico says you should use braces always. I tend to use parens. I think this is really one of those cases where it's more important to be consistent rather than you know, waging these wars of what's the right thing to do. I think it really depends on uh, um, what problems you tend to run into more often, because with either syntax, you are going to run into problems. So if you do lots of kind of template stuff and, and uh, you don't have types that use the initializer list, then, um, oh, sorry, if you do have types that, that have initializer list, then you're probably better off with parens if you don't want to do that, and parens work, and macros parens work, and templates. So that's my personal recommendation. You know, if you, if you don't care about that stuff working in templates, and instead you you know, you, you don't have problems with std initializer list constructors, then you can use, you can, some style guides say you should use curlies instead. Mm, I don't really like curlies because I think parents are more obvious, right? They tell you, well, I'm going to call a constructor and do overload resolution, right? I can, I can reason about that. I know what's going on. But, you know, it really depends. Like, I, I don't say that, you know, this is like right or wrong. Like, um, right, and then here's my last slide which is I actually made a table where I listed all the different syntaxes uh, on top and different ways of initializing things, and then the rows are different kinds of types. And then I kind of just put in there what is going to happen for this kind of initialization. So this is kind of a thing that you can kind of print out, put on the wall, and as a reminder, like what happens when. And um, So yeah, I hope this is going to be useful. Um, yeah, so that's it. Uh, that's my talk. Um, you can find me on Twitter. Um, you can also, Timur underscore audio, you can also find me on includecpp.org on the Discord. I tend to hang out there. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Do we have any time for questions? Hi, Timo. I have a real quick question here at the end. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Hello. Uh, on slide 48, you showed us uh, how to do the user-provided or not user-provided uh, default constructor. What is it? Is it user-provided or not user-provided if I write the inline keyword within the class, but then in the header below the class would then uh, use the equals default? Isn't that user provided or not? Uh, whenever the um, definition, which is the function body or the equals default, is outside of the definition of the class, it will be considered as user provided. Even with the keyword inline, yeah? Yes, that doesn't change okay. anything about that. Okay, thank you. Hi, Timur. Uh, it was an excellent talk. I can really relate how difficult it must and how daunting it must have been to put it together. 
Um, I don't actually have a question, but I think if you put this table on the last slide on a mug, you will become a very rich man. Uh, on a where should I put that? On, on a mug. On like a mug. A, like All so right. <laughs> All right, cool. I'll, yeah, maybe. I don't know if it's going to be readable because mugs are big be enough. Make, use a big mug. All right, Thanks. all right. That's a good advice. Thank you very much. Um, hello, Timur. Thank you for the talk. So I had a question about uh, C++20 uh, designated initializer. Um, so is it possible with this to emulate uh, name parameters in functions? Can you uh, that? Say that again? Like, so you, you can initialize a type with the name of the members, right? So you're talking about the new C++ yeah. 20 feature, yeah. Let's say I have a function with some option of parameters, like a parameter foo, parameter bar. Can I use a struct with a member foo on bar and then just use braces and say oh, yeah, bar like, equals something? So you're asking whether it would be possible to uh, use a brace init list in here? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So you cannot do the C thing where you do dot C dot E, but what you can do instead is you can do dot C brace dot E equals brace. So you can kind of, in a way, do that anyway, just with this extra thing. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think. Thank you. All right, I don't see any more questions. So thank you again, and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference.